It's my pleasure to welcome you here to the Clark Howard Show. You know, our mission is to serve you with advice and info that empowers you so you make better financial decisions in your life. And I hope you feel empowered with the first topic we're going to talk about to get today, negotiating your bills. You may not realize just how many things you can receive discounts on just with a little work. Also, there are thousands upon thousands. I don't know if it's beyond a million, but I'm sure it's hundreds of thousands, if not in the millions, of properties that people have purchased with the intention of renting them out short term, Airbnb, VRBO, that kind of thing. And as much as I love entrepreneurship and love having rental property, whoa, this one's getting to be more hazard at the same time there's opportunity. We need to discuss how to protect your wallet. So we have so many people who, who contact us with questions about medical bills of all types. And there's something that often we're not aware of, and that is now the overwhelming amount of bills in the United States are hospital or hospital-affiliated charges. Um, hospital systems have been trying to create uh, local shared monopolies or even a full monopoly in a marketplace and buy up every kind of doctor practice from primary care to specialty care to labs to um, uh, you know doing testing for uh, MRIs, that kind of thing. Hospitals want to own the whole thing. Well, the crazy thing is, and it's what's driving up the cost of health care, without doubt, are the hospitals not trying to create national footprint, but local monopolies or shared monopolies, meaning with typically one other in the biggest markets, two other big hospital systems to control the market. So here's the crazy part. These hospital systems overwhelmingly avoid paying taxes by claiming to be nonprofits. But these supposed nonprofits are paying the non medical administrative people millions and millions of dollars a year with perks that rival big for profit non medical companies, big, big corporations. Because they now have a license to print money, cr creating these feeder systems and these semi-monopolies or monopolies in a metro area. And here's the other part of it. So they avoid paying all the taxes they would normally have to pay on all the profits these hospital systems are making. But by being a nonprofit, they are able to take all that surplus and pay it out internally or whatever, tax-free. What comes with that obligation is that they are required to provide uncompensated care. But the reality is the hospitals are run in a way, even though they're, they're not paying taxes, as profit enterprises, and they stubbornly resist providing what used to be called charity care, now in the lingo of medicine called uncompensated care. And it doesn't necessarily involve giving people free care. It involves negotiating a, a price that you can afford and not have your credit ruined or them try to take your house from you as they can in some states and things like that. It's crazy what the lobbyists for the nonprofit hospitals have been able to push through state legislatures. So if you get a large bill from a hospital, don't ignore it. It is negotiable. 
the hospital made up the costs anyway. When you have insurance, there is this back and forth between the insurance company and the hospital. And when the hospital says, we're going to bill this, and the insurance company says, nope, and they get through all their stuff of trying to come up with what they t together, whoever's stronger, where they end up with the price, then you're hit with the balance based on the contract of the health insurance you have, usually through an employer. And you could still end up with a bonkers large bill. That is negotiable. It is negotiable. First thing you always do if you get hit with a large hospital bill is you want a full itemized bill. And you'll find over and over again that that bill has things on it that were never done to you, that were not for you. It's like they just sit there and say, oh, what code should we put down and charge this, that, and the other? And so you can't normally negotiate, depends on the hospital system, with the people at the billing department. But hospitals, nonprofits have patient advocates. They may call them patient advocate or hospital social worker or whatever. You avail yourself of that to negotiate an amount that you are able to pay against that bill. Do not ignore a bill. If you ignore it again, depending on the state, they may come and try to take your home or your money or whatever else. So that's why you don't go hide. You come forward, not aggressively or with anger or anything, assertively. Assert yourself and never agree to pay what you know in your heart of hearts you can't afford to pay. As to hospitals creating these semi or total monopolies in a local area, terrible that they were allowed to do so. It has harmed the American people. It has harmed the federal budget. It has harmed state budgets. And I believe it ultimately hurts care in an area where you eliminate competition. Allowing hospitals to own medical practices is such a bad idea, such a terrible thing. And those doctors, this came up the other day with one of our employees, that they were being pushed by the doctor, the primary care doctor, to go have various things. Oh, just because I think it would be good for you. Well, did you find anything wrong with me? No, I, I just think you should do this. And a lot of these hospital systems that own these practices push the doctors to raise utilization of all these services and diagnostics that the hospitals are offering. Be aware, be wary, know this is how it works. Krista? Okay, Jennifer in New York has a related question. Two years ago, I was traveling in Pennsylvania with my kids. One of them was feeling awful and it escalated to taking her to an urgent care center in the area. She received excellent care by the doctors and nurses there, recovered very quickly from the ear pain, and we paid a $50 copay out of pocket as I expected. 18 months later, I received another bill for $150, and after calling the insurance... Wait, you said 18 months later? Yeah. And after calling the insurance company, they advised that the urgent care resubmit the bill and insurance would review the charges. Upon requesting the urgent care center resubmit the bill... They advised that doing so could result in additional charges. I agreed, thinking that was unlikely. Later, I was charged an additional $150 for resubmitting the bill on top of the original $150, which the insurance company will not cover at all. I've escalated with both places to plead my case, and I got nowhere. I paid in full to avoid bad credit. Is this normal and fair, and should we warn your listeners of this new practice? First of all, that is a complete outrage. Second, you would not have hurt your credit at all if you did not pay that $300 bill. Because of the problems in medical billing in the country, Congress, in its infinite wisdom, passed new laws, and ultimately they became 
rules accepted by the credit bureaus and implemented by the credit bureaus, that up to $499, an unpaid medical bill from a provider, no longer can be reported on your credit report and harm your credit. So this was a uh, nuisance charge by this urgent care center. And you probably would find if you search them online, other people complaining about weirdo nuisance charges. You paid it not uh, because you owed it, because you were worried about it destroying your credit. And the good news now is up to that $500 threshold, even unpaid, it will not harm you. I'm not saying that for people to say, ah, well, well, you know, it's not going to hurt me, so I'm not going to pay that bill. But I mean, if you owe a bill, you should pay it. But in this case, it was never in any way properly handled by the provider. And I hate that they now have ill-gotten gains of your $300. That's, yeah, that's ridiculous. Um, this is from Clark in Pennsylvania. Since about a third of Americans reside in apartments, condominiums, or other municipal built multi-unit buildings, I thought this might be a good question. I've lived in an apartment building for 15 months and have paid $30 for internet from a provider of my choice. I now, however, have been informed that upon my next lease renewal, I will be required to use a different internet provider that will be added to my account at a cost of $75 a month. That's a 150% increase. Is this legal, and do the tenants have any recourse? So first of all, is it legal to have mandatory um, fees in addition to your lease? It completely depends upon where you live in Pennsylvania, if there's any municipal ordinance that prevents it, or county um, ordinance or regulation or law, whatever, whatever it's called in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. But... Um, Pennsylvania is a commonwealth, right? Along with I'm not sure. Virginia. <laughs> I should know that. Pretty sure it's the I'll commonwealth. I'll look it up. The commonwealth of Massachusetts, Virginia. Anyway, I digress. If I got that wrong, I apologize. Anyway, Chris is going to find out before we finish here. So, uh, it could be a, a state law prohibiting automatic mandatory fees in addition to your monthly rent, county or a city. If... And the lack of that, it's up to what you agree to in the lease. And it, what's the answer? Yes, and Kentucky is the fourth commonwealth. Thank you. All right. So you don't have to agree to it. They can tell you, well, if you don't agree to this egregious charge, you can't stay here anymore. And then you have to pick up and move somewhere else or say, all right, I'll let you rip me off for the 75 a month. 900 extra dollars a year. But couldn't you, ref if it's an optional, like if, if they're saying if you want internet. No, it's not optional. Even if you don't take the internet, what Clark said mm -hmm. is even if you don't take the internet, you have to pay for it anyway. Because I'll be required to use another one. Like what if... If, if it is optional, I'm just saying, what would you suggest, like a T-Mobile or Verizon, like a, a unit from them you could use without but, being but wired in? But if it's in. a mandatory fee, which yeah. apartment complexes have. I know they do do that. So if, if there is a mandatory fee and it's not prohibited in your state and you've agreed to it in your lease, you have to pay the 900 a year. And so you have to decide if they treat you like this with this junk fee, what else are they going to come up with? Are you going to stay or are you going to use this as a reason to go somewhere else? Now, if the apartment market has softness where you are and you say, okay, I'm, I'm moving, I found another deal, they may at that point say, okay, what if we give you a $75 a month discount on your rent if they can't negotiate out the $75 junk fee a month? You could do that. But it is uh, something we've had complaints about as far back as I can remember, with people being hit with mandatory fees, and it's the two things. One, does local or state law permit mandatory junk fees on an apartment lease? And two, did you agree to it in your lease? And if, you, if there's no state prohibition or governmental prohibition, and you agreed to it in your lease, they can charge you the ripoff fee. Linda in Georgia says, in December of 2021, I purchased a new Volvo and paid cash for the new car. I replaced a 12-year-old car. 
it was made perfectly clear to the salesperson from the start that this was a cash transaction and no finance paperwork was done. But even though it was a cash purchase, he told me a credit check was required. I questioned this as I had never heard of this, but it said okay. My FICO is over 800. Even though this is off of the report now that it's past two years, I do want to know if this is true or not. All right. So Linda, it's a half truth. By the way, when you're negotiating buying a vehicle, never tell a dealer up front you're a cash buyer because they will charge you more for the vehicle because they make so much money on the financing. Wait till you've made the the deal that's an ex that's a uh, agreed to deal on the price before you go to the F and I department, the finance and insurance department, and then there you say, "Here's my check." So the credit check. Auto dealers are required to verify that you are who you say you are. It's a homeland security law that was passed uh, back in the OOs after the September 11th terrorist attacks. And dealers use the easy way to do this. It's a twofer for them. They do a credit check, which can have the effect of lowering your credit score a little, not a lot, but a little, maybe 12 points. And so then they know, oh, this is somebody we really want to try to push a loan on or whatever. And they've complied with verifying who you are, that you are who you say you are, blah, blah, blah. So that's why it's done. Uh, there are many organizations that are under Homeland Security rules to verify. And it is very common that they use a credit poll as the way of doing so. Coming up ahead, we got to talk about the number one reason people are owning rental properties now, and that's for short-term rentals, and the opportunity that presents, but also the hazard that keeps hitting people hard in the face. Over the years, I've talked about with so many people the opportunity as well as the hazard of doing short-term rentals on Airbnb or VRBO. And the opportunity is clear. If you're willing to manage a place and be essentially a hotelier, you can make a lot more money from a rental property doing short-term short rentals in a vacation kind of area or even in an urbanized zone. But... The problem is the rules of the game keep changing in the middle of the game. And I talked last year about what happened to people in New York City, where New York had such a thriving Airbnb market till the city passed tight restrictions that essentially outlawed almost all Airbnbs in the city. And so suddenly people had these properties they paid for to make money as a rental on a short-term basis, and they either had to turn around and sell them, or they had to go to long-term tenants where the economics were not nearly as favorable as they were with the short-term. Now the same thing has happened in Palm Springs, California, and the LA Times reports that the impact that so many properties in Palm Springs were owned by people doing basically their own little one-unit hotels with Airbnbs, that now prices of homes in areas that had very heavy numbers of Airbnb listings have collapsed. So not only did people not have the income coming in anymore from doing Airbnb rentals, but what they could sell the property for was much less than they could the day before it became illegal to do the Airbnb rentals. So some of these price drops are like coming down a high roller coaster. And so know this, and it's something that I've repeated the same refrain pretty much for the last eight to 10 years, 
And that is, if you're buying a property to do as a short-term renter, rental property, where you're running your own little micro hotel on Airbnb or VRBO, they dominate. Make sure that the math also works if the condominium association, if you own a condominium, homeowners association, if it's in a mandatory homeowners association community, or the local government, or whatever, bans short-term rentals, can you still make a clear economic case that you're going to be positive cash flow if you have to go from short-term renters to long-term renters? If you cannot make the case that you will still have a profitable venture, not as profitable, still a profitable venture, with longer term tenants instead of short term, then you got to have the resources that you can float a negative property where you're losing money on it, potentially face the Palm Springs thing where you're having to sell a property possibly at a loss and be able to absorb that. Or you don't become a landlord of a property designed with the math when it only works is a short-term rental and does not work as a long-term rental. I mean, think about how many cities I've talked about the stuff going on in New Orleans. Um, the New York thing has been brutal for landlords. Now we've got the Palm Springs. We've got all the stuff from Hawaii that I talked about pre-COVID back in, I guess, 18 or 19 when there was this mass wave of condominium associations that said no more Airbnbs. And what happened was in Hawaii was it ended up being like two different kinds of condominium communities. Condominium communities where people buy in wanting stability, wanting it to be just people they knew who were there. And then others that were in those condominium communities wanting to own them to make money renting them out. And so it's really created almost these two classes of condominiums in the Hawaiian Islands. And you got to know what you're buying into before you buy in. If you want uh, to feel more like an intimate community, make sure you're buying in one that bans short-term rentals. And on the other hand, if you want to have short-term rentals, make sure you're buying in one where the culture of that condominium is permissive and, in fact, encouraging of short terms. I just read a story about Airbnb that kind of freaked me out as a current a frequent user. <laughs> that yeah, You love Airbnb. That there's like a huge number of hidden cameras in Airbnbs. Like there's all these lawsuits about it and crazy stuff. You know, the cameras, the, the miniaturized cameras that are so cheap, there there have always been uh, perverted people, right? Yeah. And now they've got this gateway with the cameras. They're showing up in public bathrooms. They're showing up in any of a yeah. number of places, dressing rooms yeah. and department stores and they were hotels. Saying, yeah. Remember it happened to a uh, sideline reporter That's right. for the yeah, NFL yeah, yeah. years Aaron ago? Aaron Andrews, I think it was. Oh, yeah. okay. And they were saying like ways to look from, I mean, like you can look at smoke detectors and if there's like a flashing light or... And then shower smoke heads. detectors have flashing Well, lights. that's the thing, but it's like a second little one. They showed pictures of it, and I'll have to show you the article because it, there were tips in there, but I was like, wow, like shower heads. And then I just saw a story about how this guy, the landlord, saw on his camera, like door camera, saw the guy walking in with a woman who wasn't his wife and <laughs> told the guy if he didn't pay him $950 in extra fees – that he was going to email it to his wife. Whoa! And then actually sent the email before, like, accidentally to the wife. And so now the guy's suing him because of, yeah, crazy. Okay. Okay, that's, you're, you love that kind of gossip <laughs> I mean, I story. don't. I was, I'm freaked out by it, honestly, the okay. whole hidden camera thing. 
Beth in Wisconsin says, as a child in diapers, my daughter actually worked for Kimberly Clark for their diaper testing. At that time in 1997, the Roth was not available to her. She made close to $3,000. Wow. Which, and I'm sure I have free diapers, which is so awesome, which I put in savings for her. Could I have put it in a Roth for her in 1998 when it became available, I when it was offered? I feel like she really missed out on this one. She's 26 now and has a Roth 401k and savings. Please let your listeners know if this is available to infants who do things like diaper testing. Beth, um, gosh, I'm so sorry that that the timing was just off. Now, the limit on Ross would not have covered 3000 but you could have gotten some of the money in it uh, if it had been happening at that time, or you could have done a traditional. The thing is, you save the money, and yeah, it's not tax-free like it would have been in the Roth, but it's great that you have a child who in diapers <laughs> was working. Talk about child labor laws. This is great. Yeah. Your kids it, worked really young, right? Yeah. Like, my kids, you know, my wife's an actress and if they need kids in a commercial, they like to hire when they're really young, they like to hire the parent who's an actor because they know the kid's going to be more cooperative, hopefully on set. And so two of my three kids made money very young. And uh, fortunately for them, they were able to do the Roth because the first one did it in 99. Yeah, on their own. And uh, Daddy did that, right? (laughs) Stevie and then uh, Grant did in 2005 and six. I think he, both of them did a couple of things. And so, uh, so they've got these Roths that have grown all these years. The fact that she's 26, she's doing a Roth 401k, she's got savings. This is great. And um, if your kids are working anyway, single digit could be there, whatever business they're doing, they're doing babysitting, lawns, whatever, that money can be turned into Roth money fully, legally, and properly and grow tax free. For the next 60 years. Think about that. That was it's nice. Spent tax free. That Beth wants to let other parents know that was Which super sweet. Which is why sweet. we Love talked it. about it. Yeah. Dave in Washington says, I've closed my Roth IRA early after being unemployed for the last four plus months. Oh man, I'm really sorry. sorry. Dave. I did not have Vanguard withhold taxes. Should I do anything proactively before doing my 2024 taxes next year other than setting, the ten- setting aside 10% of the total? Okay, so first of all, Dave, I hope that soon you find a good work opportunity. Uh, That's what I'd focus on right now. The tax bill you'll have for the Roth will not be 10% of all the money in it. It'll be 10% of the earnings. The money you contributed to the Roth is not subject to penalty, only the earnings the Roth has had. So the tax burden you'll have will be a tiny fraction of what it would be with a traditional IRA. And so give your mind some peace about that and just keep your focus on hopefully finding a great new job opportunity soon. Yes. Don in Virginia says, my wife and I have zero credit card debt and we pay our cards off every month. I watch my credit score religiously and try to never use our debit card, but only our credit card. I use it to pay bills online, buy groceries, Amazon, etc. I feel it protects me and allows me to carry less cash. However, I've seen that using my credit card too much hits my score, my credit score negatively. Yet places like Credit Karma keep suggesting I get another card to improve my credit score, which is usually around 800 to 820. This is very confusing to me and seems to make no sense. What's your take on this? Okay, first of all, Don, you know when you're beyond 800, you're referred to as golden in the banking industry. Uh, whatever utilization you've got, it's not enough for you to worry about if your score is consistently above 800. Now, utilization, the percent of the available credit you're using on that one credit card. I talked about this just on another show recently. If it goes above 30%, your score starts to dive. So it's very much to your advantage to, um, if you are charging a big percent of the credit you have on that card, to follow actually Credit Karma's suggestion and get another card. Get one that's a, 
uh, no annual fee card. It's got a good cash back, which is 2%. And then use that card as well, potentially, so that you are reducing your overall utilization. I always like for everybody to have two cards from two different issuing financial institutions. So if one of them decides they don't want you anymore, you still have that other card. I call it the Noah's Ark rule. And so having just one credit card puts you a little on the edge if for whatever business reason, even having nothing to do with you, they decide they don't want you anymore, you suddenly have instantly no access to credit. So for that reason alone, I think it's worthwhile for you to get a second card. And not to spend more on cards, just to spend less as a percent of the available credit on what's the card now that would become the two cards. And thank you so much for joining us today. Hope you learned something today, found something that was useful to you in your life. And remember what we're all about, our mission, for you to learn ways to save more, spend less, and don't let anyone ever rip you off.